Today we're really going to start talking about forces. So far we've mostly talked about things moving but not really given a reason for why they move or accelerate. And really what we're going to get in today is forces which sort of is the cause behind all of that. It's why things move, why things change their movement, and also kind of why things sit still sometimes. And to get started with that, we're going to introduce you guys to Sir Isaac Newton a little bit, because a lot of what we're talking about is what we call Newtonian mechanics. It really came from Isaac Newton. So say hello to Isaac Newton. Isaac says hello to you. Isaac Newton was born in 1642 on Christmas Day. This was the same year that Galileo died. And Isaac Newton was a really tiny baby. He was very premature and not expected to live. Fortunately for us, he did. He lived, grew up with his mother part of the time and with his grandmother part of the time and then back with his mother. And at age 13, went away to grammar school and lived in town with the local apothecary. And he was expected to come back home at 17 and be a farmer. Luckily for us, he was a lousy farmer, and it's been said that he was an utter failure as a farmer. His mother's brother convinced his mother that he should instead go to school and study, that that would be a much better sort of route for him. And so he left for Trinity College in Cambridge in 1661. He paid his way through college. Um, he waited tables. He cleaned up for faculty and wealthier students, and eventually was elected as a scholar, which gave him a four-year scholarship paid for his tuition for four years. And things were going really well until the plague actually reached the Cambridge area in 1665. He had to return home, and he spent the time when he was at home really concentrating on studying math and physics, and came back in a much better spot. He returned in 1667, began to work on alchemy, and then a Mer scholar Mercator published a book talking about sort of mathematical methods. And Newton wrote this response to that, talking about his much broader results. He had a mentor named Isaac Barrow, who had just been sort of appointed to this prestigious professorship, Lucasian professorship. And Barrow passed on Newton's work. It got out of acclaim, and then Barrow actually resigned his professorship so Newton could have the job. In an interesting twist with this, at that time, to sort of have that job at Trinity College, the person in that role had to agree to take holy orders, to be a fellow of Trinity College, holy orders within the Church of England. And Newton wasn't really comfortable with this. He wasn't able to accept the current beliefs, but the church actually made a royal decree. Well, King Charles II made a royal decree that excused him from needing to take the holy orders and in fact excused anyone into the future from taking, from being required to take the holy orders. They were allowed to, just not required to. One of the most famous, sort of more recent people to hold this professorship was actually Stephen Hawking. So, there's Isaac Newton at Trinity College in Cambridge. His first major public scientific achievement was that he built a reflecting telescope. He didn't just design it, he ground the glass and did everything to build it. And then in 1686, he published Principia, which is really a foundational work for all that we know about physics today. It was where he first talked a lot about universal gravitation and is really a basis for a lot of our current understanding of physics. That's a little bit of history. But I think it's great to know a little bit about where all of this came from. Because again, much of our understanding of how and why objects move is really based on concepts that arose from Newton. You hear it in popular culture sometimes about Newton having the apple fall on his head and that being part of his understanding of gravitation. And he's really sort of the father of a lot of what we understand with physics. So. Back to forces. We've talked a lot about acceleration. Acceleration is a change in velocity. And acceleration is associated with a force, a push or a pull. I don't know if this has happened to you when you've thought about acceleration in thinking through the problems, but a lot of times you can sort of think of it as being if something is moving to the right, 
but slowing down, it's like it's being pulled to the left. And kind of intuitively we know that for something to change velocity, it requires a force. So what are forces? Well, forces come in many types and sizes. We have forces that we call applied forces, which are when you push on something. We have spring forces, we have tension forces, we have electrical forces, magnetic forces, friction forces, lots of different types. And they come in all kinds of sizes, from the very, very tiny to the very, very huge. One term we use to sort of group them is that forces can be contact or non-contact. When this man on the left is running along with his jogging stroller, he is contacting the stroller right here and pushing. So that would be an applied contact force because he's actually touching the object on which he's exerting the force. We have this skydiver right here. We know that the earth is exerting a force of gravity on the skydiver, but the earth isn't touching the skydiver. So gravity is often a non-contact force. The two objects do not need to be touching for gravity to act. We'll also find that electric forces are non-contact and what you've probably seen is magnetic forces are non-contact. A magnet can affect an object even when they are not in contact. Regardless of whether a force is contact or non-contact, forces always come from the interaction of two bodies. You cannot have a force that only involves one body. If we think about the skydiver, we might only really see the skydiver, but that force of gravity comes from an interaction of the skydiver and the earth. For the man pushing the stroller, the force that's moving the stroller forward comes from the man interacting with the stroller. And we always have to have this interaction of two bodies to have a force. This brings us to Newton's first law, now that we have a sense of what forces are. And Newton's first law is very commonly misquoted, but it's something that you've probably heard of before. So Newton's first law says that when no net force acts on a body, it moves with a constant velocity. You'll frequently hear it stated as a body in motion tends to stay in motion, a body at rest tends to stay at rest. And that's mostly true but Newton's first law is a bit more rigorous than that. So no net force means that if we add all the forces acting on the body, the sum of them is zero. This doesn't mean there are no forces acting on the body. It just means that the sum of the forces is zero. And when we talk about the sum of the forces, we're gonna talk about a vector sum. We also say that it moves with a constant velocity. This does not mean that it stays at rest necessarily. If it is at rest, then a constant velocity obviously is staying at rest. But if it is moving, it remains moving in a straight line and at the same speed, because that's what would be a constant velocity. So the common phrasing of Newton's first law as a body at rest tends to stay at rest and a body in motion tends to stay in motion could be more accurately rephrased as a body at rest tends to stay at rest and a body in motion tends to stay in motion in the same direction and at the same speed unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. When we say unbalanced force, we mean that there's not another force with the same magnitude in the opposite direction so that the net force is equal to zero. So let's think about this in a few situations. Say I go to the front door of my house, which is locked, and I push on it. I can push as hard as I want, and the door is not going to move. Because when I push on the door, the lock and the frame of the door push on the door in the other direction, so there's no net force on the door and it doesn't accelerate. What if I slide a hockey puck across the ice and we'll say the ice has just been sort of zambonied, it is perfectly smooth and when I slide that hockey puck it's going to just keep going 
in a straight line at the same speed until it hits the wall or something like that. And when it hits the wall, the wall exerts a force on it and produces an acceleration. It changes that velocity. So in, as long as it's sliding across the ice there, there's no net force acting on my hockey puck. And it slides with a constant velocity. I say no net force because gravity is still acting on the hockey puck and the ice is still holding the hockey puck up, but the sum of those two forces are zero. Some of the forces is zero. I apologize for my grammar. What if I roll a ball across the floor? If it's a nice smooth floor, this works just like the hockey puck. My ball will keep rolling forever as long as the floor is flat and is very, very smooth until some other force acts upon it. What about if I'm driving to work one morning and I'm running a little bit late and I've got my coffee sitting up on the dashboard and I turn really sharply to the left? My car is going to turn, but my coffee isn't going to turn. And that's why your coffee spills when you do that. My coffee tries to continue on at a constant velocity, at the same speed and in a straight line, unless some force causes it to change direction or to change speed, some unbalanced force. What about if I set a ball on the table and it sits there nice and still? I think we can all agree that the velocity is constant then. But are there any forces acting on that ball? Absolutely. Gravity is obviously acting on that ball. And the table is supporting that ball. We can sort of see that the table is supporting that ball because if the table wasn't there, the ball would fall. So the table must be exerting some force on the ball. Professor Sheldon was kind enough to do a little demonstration for me here. And you can see he's got the sort of table set with the apple and all, the tablecloth. And when he pulls slowly, the objects move. But when he pulls quickly, all of the objects stay on the table. It's their inertia related to their mass that keeps them from moving. Their inertia makes it so that unless there is a force that acts upon them to make them move, an unbalanced force, they don't move. In the first example, when he pulled slowly, friction was able to move them. But when he pulled quickly, they essentially stayed in place. In this demonstration, Professor Sheldon is setting up three beakers topped by a metal pie plate and then three toilet paper rolls because you know it's a high class demonstration like that and we're putting tennis balls on top of each of the rolls. In just a second he's going to take a broom, bend it back, and then knock the, that pie plate out. What do you think is going to happen to the tennis balls when the pie plate is knocked out? 